Well, welcome everyone. Uh, this is Professor uh, David Lurcher from the uh, School of Information at San Jose State University. And I'm just uh, really excited about uh, introducing you to Jennifer Brown. And uh, I think uh, uh, you're all going to really enjoy the conversation <laughs> on constructing a learning commons today. So Jennifer, uh, uh, tell us about yourself and your school. Well, thank you for having me. I'm very excited that we were able to, to get together and have this conversation. So uh, as you said, my name is Jennifer Brown. Uh, on my social media, it's usually Jen. Uh, so if you see Jen Brown, that's me too. Um, and um, I am really privileged to be in a new school. I've been teaching for about 25 years. I started in the Toronto District School Board um, in, um, in uh, Ontario. And um, then partway about nine years into my career, moved to the Peel District School Board, which uh, for those who know a little bit of geography of Ontario is just adjacent to the Toronto District School Board. And, and we encompass a pretty large geographical area. Um, and so I've had lots of experiences, you know, teaching uh, a variety of grades, uh, English as a second language. Uh, I'm a kindergarten to grade 10 certified teacher, so an elementary teacher. Um, and then found a real passion for teacher librarianship um, uh, when I came back after one of my uh, mat leaves in about 2011. That's when I really kind of, you know, uh, fell in love with teacher librarianship and have been in some way part of the teacher librarian community here in Ontario since then. So my current school is new to me as of September 2022, but mm -hmm. it was actually built in 1965. Oh, so wow. it's a really um, established community. It is a small, um, although it is in a town um, called Caledon Village, um, it is it draws from a lot of rural communities in our area. So it's a big change for me having predominantly taught in Toronto and in Brampton, which is a larger city, which is also part of our board. Um, so that's a real uh, unique change. Um, and in my experiences in libraries, prior, I had done brand new schools. So I had done a, uh, taken over a library that was only two years old. And then for the past seven years, I'd been in a library that I had opened from scratch before it was built. I was picking, you know, the furniture and the floors and every single book. So um, that is its own undertaking, which is probably a whole other video and conversation. Right. Um, but coming into an established space that has a real legacy, but also that has some carryovers of some um, physical aspects of the space that wouldn't necessarily be how we would design a learning commons now today. Um, and then certainly some collection management that needed done. Um, and the biggest change uh, in terms of that school, as I said, it's a kindergarten to grade eight school. Um, we have um, some, because we draw from other smaller schools, we have students who start with us in kindergarten and stay till the end of grade eight. And then we have a small portion of students that come from two other rural schools that mm. don't come to us until grade seven. So they're only with us for grade seven and eight. Um, so that's been a unique aspect of um, learning about the community and how to support welcoming these new students in grade seven when we already have these very established community connections. So that's been all very new for me. Um, the, um, my role is half library. So half of my job is teacher librarian and half of my job is guidance counselor for the school. Um, that's also a learning curve for me in the sense of it's the first time I'm the guidance counselor for a school, but also in my previous library practice, I was at much larger schools. This school is around 350 students, even though we're kindergarten oh. to grade eight. Um, my other schools were all around a thousand to 1500 students. Oh, wow. Um, so I was always full-time library, the way our staffing model worked. So wearing right. two hats, um, I've had to design the space with that in mind too. So that's been really an interesting thing. And the final thing, just to give a sense of the school, um, unlike my last school, which had three, two of my four walls were glass to the outside. This library is physically in the center of the building on the first floor, mm -hmm. which is amazing but there are no outside windows, wow. no natural light at all. And, you know, we can, um, we can, you can imagine the, the fluorescent lighting, the kind of drop ceiling, the kind of, the kind of older space that it is, it has lots of doors in and out, old wooden doors, which I love. Um, I forgot that they, you know, smell different when it rains and all of that good stuff about old wooden <laughs> doors. 
Um, but that's been a real shift too, because the aesthetic of the last two spaces I've been in as a teacher librarian, the natural light, um, the, the high, I had double, you know, height ceilings, right. the existing lighting, they all created a certain aesthetic, um, energy in the space that was beautiful no matter what else I did not that I didn't do other beautiful things in those spaces and I have a very big passion for you know um, environment as third teacher and you know have done a lot of my own learning and understanding of that Um, but this space although it's very uh, spacious in some ways it doesn't have those built-in um, aesthetic aspects that make it appealing. So we have to make some really conscious decisions about how to make the space inviting, um, despite its wonderful physical location being in the heart of the building, the center of the building. Um, it doesn't have some of those natural things um, that we would look for if we were designing a building from scratch. So that's a lot about the building, but it gives you a little bit of a sense. Well, so talk to us about your vision of uh, the difference between a, a library and now a learning commons. Just uh, mm. tell us what you think. Yeah, and I think um, in this space, and I, I've already alluded to it, I think, but I wanted to honor the fact that there is a lot of established learning and working that has been happening in that space for decades, right? I, I didn't want to just assume that wonderful connected work wasn't happening in the space. But I also have to come in with my core beliefs about what a library learning common should feel like and be um, as I got to know the community. So not making big decisions around, um, you know, um, that were non-negotiable, um, could wait and develop with the children, which is kind of the phase we're at now, but making some decisions about what did I want the space to feel like for students when they entered it and what changes did we have to make and one of the unique things about this time period is that in our board um for from really from march of 2020 until really until the spring of 2022 our school libraries were either fully closed like not accessible at all because of the pandemic or they had very limited access or they were accessible, but many of us, um, because we were very short staffed due to the pandemic, many of us were reassigned to classrooms. So I had to recognize that what I was walking into was not necessarily a reflection of the legacy of the space. It was a little bit of a space that had become a catch-all um, and a space that was in a little bit of survival mode because I knew all libraries were like that. Um, so. I went in as judgment free as I could to the space, but knowing that I believe very much that children need to know the space belongs to them and that is theirs to, you know, shift and curate, uh, co-construct with me and with their educators. I I knew that was really important. I knew that um, helping children see that they were more important than the books or the iPads or the computers or the robots in the space. And so what did, what physical changes did I need to make to the collection, but also to um, how the collection was displayed. Accessibility was a big concern for me because the shelving is quite old. And so um, we designed shelving. We There was no mobile shelving. There wasn't sort of things that we could shift and change and everything was quite high. Um, so I had some, some really core beliefs about that. And because I, I want this space to mean um, it can mean different things to different students. And so creating opportunities, um, uh, I call them vignettes, like little uh, oh. moments that they can have in the space and that can change. Um, but first I had to establish with the children and the educators and with the, the families that the space belonged to them and that they could access it in different ways for different purposes. So whether that was just they need to come sign out to new books, which is amazing. Whether it is for a calming space, whether it's for a space to construct or build, whether it's for a space to problem solve, um, uh, and then obviously moving towards intentional collaboration with educators. But initially it was just for me about how do I send those messages to students when I myself don't know the students yet and I don't know the space that well yet. So I, I really 
started with, um, and thankfully I had an administrator who um, uh, gave me lots of time and space. So we didn't open right away. I, I have a very strong belief that if the school is open the first day of school, the library should be open the first day of school. And I was able to achieve that in my previous practice. But for this year, we established with the learning community that, um, you know, it was going to remain a little bit inaccessible for a few weeks so that I could work through the collection. I moved and touched and looked through every single book on the shelf, uh, on the shelves. Um, so um, we weeded about 3000 books out of the collection. Um, and, um, we knew that that needed done for a variety of reasons. Um, some of it being that the collection had some outdated content in it. Some of it being that we are going through a, a real process of looking through the lens of anti-oppression and anti-racism, um, in our board and beyond. And I feel like that's something I had always done in my practice, but because I had never taken over a really established collection before I had had the privilege of making those decisions as I went, where now I had to, you know, really start deciding, is this book potentially causing harm if we leave it on the shelf? Or is this book outdated? That, that kind of thing. So I, I started with, with weeding and collection management, which we know is its own entire conversation. Um, and then I just tried to look at how to make the books um, uh to the walls, if that makes sense. Uh, not that we don't want library shelving, but all of the books were on one side of the space and all of them were just against the wall, um, shelved very tight, very tight. The collection was way too big for the way they were shelved and um, spine out. So how was I going to take some of the existing furniture because we were not in a position to buy all new shelving and everything at that point. Um, how was I going to take the existing furniture and make the whole space come alive with literacy and books and make those books more accessible to students who are either, you know, just tiny because they're young. Uh, we have students who are in wheelchairs. We have students who are using other mobility devices. So I really started creating um, little pockets of where students could find different books for different purposes. So I did really start with the books in mind. Um, and then there were some play materials that I also started to consider. So for a very small example is um, a lot of the hands-on play materials. Um, I merged the book collections, the kind of how to, how to make, how to draw, how to code. I merged the play materials and the books into a zone, into a vignette. So that wow. if I'm a kid who wants to know how to build something with Lego, the books about how to build things with Lego are right beside the Lego. Okay. rather than then having to travel to the nonfiction section to find them. So I made some of those little choices, not knowing whether they would serve the children or not, but just based on my previous experiences. Right. So, so we're thinking about zones and for various types of learning to go mm -hmm. on across mm -hmm. the school, individuals, small groups, large mm -hmm. groups, and that's all happening simultaneously. How on mm -hmm. earth, you know, uh, in some people's <laughs> minds, that's total chaos, right? Mm -hmm. So how, how are you creating a space that's multi-purpose? You know, mm -hmm. it's not just all about books. It's, it's yes. about learning of all types, right? And various things mm -hmm. that teachers are doing, co-teaching, mm -hmm. all of that business. So, so uh, what have you done to try to create uh, this multi-learning space? Mm -hmm. So again, because I, I hadn't had time to ob observe kids in the space now in our conversation now, I can speak to changes I've made. But at that point, when I was first starting inheriting this older space, um, one of the things, because I wear the two hats of guidance counselor and librarian, one of the things that my administrator and I had a really thoughtful conversation around was how the space is a reflection of those two roles. And I was really passionate and she was very supportive of um, not having the library seen as just one thing. So for example, there was a kind of a traditional teacher librarian office um, that's part of the space. Um, and um, we had a really thoughtful conversation about that space is where, um, what we, you would typically have as a guidance office or 
space in an, in another part of the school, maybe attached to the main office or whatever, we cleared that out. And that space is now a space for myself, for students, for educators to work with small groups. Um, it's got calming materials in it. It's got a little tent for any student who needs a calming, quiet space. It's got soft lighting um, that we've put in. Um, it's got some alternative sound escape materials in there. So kids who need a calming space, it's another place where a private phone call or a private conversation can happen. I didn't, I wanted kids both to physically know and teachers to know where to find me. I wanted them to have the sense that the whole space belonged to them. Like not like this is a grown up space and this is a kid's space. Um, and I wanted, um, I wanted kids and the community as a learning community to start seeing you can use it for different purposes because over the past few years again without speaking to the legacy of the space because I hadn't been part of the school before over the past few years our library learning commons had really just become book in book out because of the pandemic yeah. restrictions so that was a big change the other factor for me was um in my experience the way a learning commons works best is when we foster independence in the parts of the space that students don't need us to do for them. So what am I doing for students that they could be doing for themselves? So one of my first priorities was independent free flow book exchange. So students of all ages can come in in independently or in small groups um, or with a supportive educator, you know, some of our friends who are not ready yet ready to do it 100% by themselves. Um, and they can do their book exchange piece if they're just there to get new books, whether I'm available or not. And right. that was a huge priority for me. It also is a big mindset shift for a lot of adults in learning communities <laughs> yeah. um, that we can, number one, trust children to do that. Yeah. Number two, that I'm not going to limit how many books a child signs out, for example. Uh -huh. <laughs> number three, that... Uh, consumables and as much as I love them and I'm surrounded by them in my own space um the kids matter more than the books so if a child comes and says I've lost that book we are never charging for a book we are never you know shaming that child their accounts get cleared so yeah. I had to prioritize mindset um and that's a very it seems like a very small goal but to me in my practice it has been foundational in getting to the intentional collaborative teaching and small group instruction. Because if all I'm doing is, and I don't love this word, but I'll use it. If I'm only policing book exchange, I'm not getting to the teaching and learning. That's right. And so this fall uh, was really about trust with the students, their families, and my colleagues to say, this does work. We believe in you. We do trust you. And yes, we're probably going to lose a few books in the process, and that's okay. And what's um, happened to the behavior, uh, 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 you know, from September to right. uh, now, uh, you know, in uh, uh, March? What's happened so, to the kids, They're, how they behave? Something I thought was going to happen, thankfully, came true. <laughs> you know, you never know, but they take such ownership. They take such pride in the books, in the space. They are able to come and sign out books and do that piece. They want to talk to me about their books. And if I'm available, I'm thrilled to talk to them about their books. But they don't need me. And the sense of accomplishment and skill that they have is exactly what I had seen in other schools. But, you know, you never know when you try it somewhere new, right? Um, yeah. And they take very good care of each other. So one of the things I love about the idea of a space being accessible in this way is that, you know, they'll come in and if a little one is struggling, there's always an older kid around who goes, oh, I'll help them. Or they run into their cousin or they run into their neighbor or they run into their sibling. And um, so the, that part of the space is absolutely thriving. And I had kind of, I, I tend to get excited. And so I had wanted to pace myself, right? I thought, well, if by the end of the year, kids are really comfortable with this, then we've achieved our goal. It was well before our December break. And we truthfully, um, between the changes we were making, and truthfully, I, I fell ill with COVID in the fall. So I lost a couple of weeks of school. Um, 
Canadian Thanksgiving is in October. <laughs> so we didn't open until um, uh, about six weeks into the school year. I had hoped it would be four weeks, but it was six weeks. Um, so we opened right around Canadian Thanksgiving and it just never stopped. And we now have educators who have, I wasn't sure they were sold, um, but just in the past few weeks, we've had some educators reach out either impromptu in the hall or send me like formal emails just saying like, we see you, we see what you're doing. We see what it's creating in our kids. Mm -hmm. um, they're seeing that, that shift. So behavior itself, um, if anything, kids are getting opportunities to demonstrate independence that they probably were getting in other spaces, but maybe not, right? So I'm always like, well, maybe this is the space where it's happening for them. So it's allowed me to actually start moving a little faster than I expected with some of the other teaching practices that I was hoping to bring in, which has been really, really powerful. And one of the great things I've noticed is when I'm at events and um, I run a virtual read aloud uh, for families once a month, we do lots of in-person events, but we found that was one of the carryovers that families really appreciated being able to be cuddled up in their own pajamas and listen to a story over the computer. Mm -hmm. um, even families who haven't necessarily attended everything, they're all talking and they're saying, you know, either they're asking me questions like, really, like they can take this many books or they can take any book they want. You know, I never say to a kindergarten student, you can't read that. Don't take it. No, no, no. That's there's wow. a there's a time for decodable text and there's a time for self-selection. Right. And and so I, you know, so families have asked these questions with great curiosity, but great joy, great, you know, they've been very appreciative and all of them have talked about their children coming home and talking about the space. And, you know, they like to credit me too. And that's very nice to receive a compliment, but um, for me, it's more about that means the messaging is getting through to all the stakeholders in the community, which is one of the challenges, right. Of creating a learning exactly. commons is how do you get the messaging out um, mm -hmm. in a way that People feel comfortable with their questions, with their doubts, with their curiosities. And so I think that's really, if we think September to March, I think we've made a lot of progress, which is very exciting. Yeah. So anyway, so it's really interesting that it's not only a learning commons, but it's the guidance center also. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, of course, you're in a small school. And mm -hmm. so you're kind of half time, but you're really full time in two roles, right? <laughs> yeah. But you know, yes. uh, most schools, you know, could have the guidance counselor, you know, mm -hmm. office in the in the learning commons, you know, or they mm -hmm. can have an art teacher have a part time office, you know, so yeah. that the specialists of the school have a much mm -hmm. broader uh, who all have uh, broad interest in students. They can watch mm -hmm. all the stuff happening and contribute to that whole yes. idea of not only consuming knowledge, but creating knowledge mm -hmm. and all sorts of formats and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So what's mm -hmm. your advice to administrators on how to how to tra help transform, uh, you know, a space with a person like you into <laughs> something that's really going to make a difference in the school? <laughs> so I will say the previous school where I built the library from scratch, uh, co-constructed it with the community. And then this one, I think in both cases, uh, um, relationship with the administrators where I could say to them, try this, and I don't know if it's going to work. And I think that is that trusting piece of I'm going to give this a try or we're going to give this a try. We're going to observe how it impacts learning or doesn't impact learning. Um, ongoing conversation of that. So the idea that I do have a lot of core philosophies, I do, I have done a tremendous amount of learning and growing and research and understanding my practice but I also don't 100% know if things are going to work until I do them with students and my colleagues so I think that is the first piece from an administrator perspective is having that conversation with your school library professional to say to them I'm willing to go on this journey with you and right and not everything is going to go as expected and that's okay because all of that is data that tells us should and shouldn't try next it's all information gathering so i think that's the first thing um the other thing is is that in this case for example 
Um, you know, in my previous building a library from scratch, you know, I was handed $125,000, you know, for books. Wow. That's my administrator has been very generous with her budget. Um, so budget is always a thing. But we're a small school. We don't have capital budget money coming in. It's not like we're a rebuild or a new school. Um, you know, and so I think the idea also that it is a process. So I sort of, you know, I wrote up um, kind of my top three goals for just the fall, just like what are the priorities for the fall? So, you know, managing the collection, um, building relationship and connection with staff, students and community stakeholders, and then making the space accessible for free flow book access. I was really transparent and my administrator understood that all the things she knows I'm capable of and all the things that she might've known I was doing at my previous school, she understood that wasn't magically gonna happen right away. So I think understanding that it's a process and from that budget perspective, um, I, I was sharing with you that, um, for example, this week that we're recording this, um, my, our space is getting all new floors and all new lighting that are going to be on dimmers, which I know sounds like a very tiny thing, but when you're in an old school with fluorescent lighting, being able to tone down those lights is very powerful, right? Yeah. Um, from a sensory perspective and just from a third teacher perspective. So, um, so I made all these changes and then a week ago, we got an email that says, take everything out of the library. You're getting new floors because we asked for them um, and you're getting and you're getting new lighting. So that we're doing the floors and the lighting, but we don't yet have the budget for the new shelving proposal that I've put in. So that might be the summer. That might be a year from now. So right. I think for administrators and and for me too to remind myself, it's OK to not have everything done right away to pace myself. Right. But that ongoing like. Where do we see it getting to in two or three years? I love a three-year plan. I'm like really yeah. into three-year plans. And so in three years from now, what do we hope it looks like, sounds like, and feels like? And on that journey, knowing I will probably have changed my answers three years from now, but at least we have a vision for that direction. So I think those are kind of the big administrator to school library professional um, relationship conversations that I think are very important. The pressure to just magically have it done, um, I think it does is it puts too much pressure, but it also negates the importance of co-construction with the children and the other educators in the building. If I go in and I just change everything to look exactly the way my other school looked, even if you handed me $500,000, I could do that, but it may not serve the learners that I'm currently working with. And I think that's also part of the challenge is we all want to make our mark. I think sometimes I've been a teacher a long time. So most of my friends are administrators because I'm that old now. Um, and I don't <laughs> want to become an administrator. That's not my path. So I think sometimes administrators feel pressure to make their mark. And sometimes the learning commons can be the, the crown jewel, if you will, to lose, yes. use a colonialist term um, that they think, well, if I change everything in the, in the learning commons, um, that's going to show what a great leader I am. And I'm not saying they shouldn't prioritize the learning commons. Obviously, I want their money and I want their support and all of that. But we can't just make sweeping changes because they worked somewhere else. We have to do them with the learning community. And I would say to administrators, even if you magically have that budget, school library professionals and the rest of your learning community, be really thoughtful and intentional with what those changes are. Why are you making those changes? I could answer when children said to me, the kids can call me Jen or Mrs. Brown. It doesn't matter to me. Um, I'm trying to de deflate some of those hierarchical practices. And so when they said to me, Jen, why are you getting rid of the carpet? It wasn't just because I wanted to change the carpet. It was, the, I had a list of reasons why we were changing to a different kind of flooring. And mm -hmm. then the kids were like, I didn't think of that. That's really interesting. So even those little conversations, um, just understanding that what works in one learning community is not magically going to be the same thing, but your goal and intention can be the same, your long-term vision. And I think administrators go. sometimes miss that part because they feel so much pressure to get stuff done, if that makes sense. There, there you go. Well, I my conclusion is we ought to uh, 
do this conversation a year from now. Yes. <laughs> and to yes. see yes. and to see because that that is a wonderful point. You know, a learning commons kind of is never done. I mean, you're always moving because you're adapting to learners, teachers, etc. Well, Jen, mm -hmm. this has been a great experience with you. Uh, we're so appreciate uh, your enthusiasm and the great things you're doing for the children there. So we'll just say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. you. Thank to, you. This uh, is awesome. And uh, we'll talk again. Absolutely. I look forward to it. All right.